Okay, hello everybody. It is Justin Nielsen here and welcome to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It is June 22nd, 2022 and on the show as always, we've got Arusha Paris, portfolio manager over there at O'Neill Global Advisors. Welcome back Arusha. Hey, always good to be here, Justin. Okay, and also we are going to welcome back to the show Richard Moglin. He is a director of education at Trader Lion. So we're going to see with all of this education under his belt how he's been handling this correction. Uh, welcome back to the show, Richard. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Okay. Yeah, I wonder if we should give uh, Richard a little pop quiz. A pop quiz, right? Exactly. He's a director of education. <laughs> what was William J. O'Neill's middle name? So anyway, oh. now we'll 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 save the questions for later. We'll we'll set, save that for the after uh, after show and uh, maybe turn it into a drinking game or something. But um, well, on on today's show, we are going to talk a little bit about that difference between theory versus reality. You know, there's so much education out there, but sometimes the emotions and actually following through on that education, following through on what you're supposed to do can be a lot more difficult. So that's what we got on in store for you. But as always, we are going to start out with the market. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the NASDAQ composite. And Richard, I want to just kind of get your thoughts on with the with the education that you've kind of immersed yourself in. And granted, you haven't been at this for very long, but now you're you're kind of witnessing a, a full blown correction, a, an actual bear market that lasts longer than just a few seconds here, like we had in the past. Yeah, absolutely. So trading since 2018, obviously uh, don't have that experience in 2008, 2000, uh, but just learning the principles that Canslem teaches and and given kind of the journey that I've been on, uh, it's been enough to kind of protect myself during this correction bear market, whatever you want to label it as. So. I like to keep things very simple. I use a lot of the same moving averages that a lot of can slim traders use the 21 EMA, the 50 SMA, and of course the 200 SMA and just keeping it simple, looking at this chart, we're below decline 21, 50 and 200 SMA. So, you know, taking all those timeframes into account, we're in a downtrend. So right now we're potentially experiencing a counter trend rally, um, off kind of oversold levels, but we just made new lows on the year. Uh, so this rally to me is a little bit guilty until proven innocent, meaning that it actually gets back above that 21 EMA and that 21 EMA starts to curl up to the downside. That's what I'm really looking for. And taking a step back, not just looking at the indexes, I always like to consider the trend and, and health and breadth of market leadership as well, because that's such an important component to it as well. And right now we're starting to see maybe some solar names start to lead, maybe some biotech health healthcare names, but we're not seeing kind of a huge explosion in, in yeah. groups and also overall setups uh, appear as well. So really when that fall through day really comes and we're going to restart a new uptrend, we should see a ton of setups out there and we should be kind of, you know, trying to find, um, you know, just try to pick out of all these setups what to buy. And right now we're not seeing that proliferation of setups. And uh, right now I think less is more given, given the overall conditions and, uh, it's also just extremely volatile. So that's kind of my overall take in the market. Uh, less is more right now. We're in a correction and we'll have to see, you know, what comes out of it. And uh, no predictions. We just have to kind of take it day by day and uh, manage risk along the way. So that's kind of my uh, my overall thoughts on the market. Yeah, I, I almost think it's it's not fair that you get to learn about uh, manage a bear market so well and stay out of this, <laughs> unlike most of us, where we had to ride down and get mauled in, in our uh, one of these bear markets to truly learn it. But well said, Richard. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. The, the big thing here is obviously we are in a downtrend, but a lot of times where I get most of my indication or the, the best indicator are, are the individual stocks. Mm -hmm. And there are very, very few stocks that are setting up. In fact, if I click on the open stock ideas button here, there are nine stocks in the near pivot and a few of them might even be just uh, stocks that have been acquired there. So uh, I, I last think week almost I, all of them are. Uh, oh, I, think there, <laughs> I think there's there only not, two on yeah. the near pivot screen that aren't acquisitions. There you go. So and last That's week I was like four. Yeah, four. And they were all being acquired. So if you don't have a lot of stocks setting up, you're not going to have many reasons to buy and get exposure in this market. Um, and and that's even you know you're not even taking into account the the, mar the market itself where you're having all these falter days, uh, failing left and right. So if you if you use both of those, the market and the individual stocks, uh, that's going to save you a lot of pain in these times where uh, they don't come around that often. 
but when they do, they, they can really make a lot of people pay for the bad habits that they developed over the previous years. And, and so, Richard, uh, maybe go into a little bit more of when when you kind of saw the signs that things were turning. I mean, certainly we've a lot of people have been talking about how February of 2021 was when a lot of the individual stocks started to get into trouble, especially those that were the darlings of COVID. Um, but then you had this issue where the S&P 500, the indexes looked fine. They were making new highs. And, and so at what point did you kind of realize, oh, hey, something's, something's changed here? Yeah, that's a great question. And just kind of like what Arush is doing right now, I kind of look at a few different proxies for growth stocks to kind of get an overall sense of, you know, what are the stocks actually doing? Because the S&P 500 and, and the NASDAQ composite, uh, those do a great job of kind of showing what the larger caps are doing. Mm -hmm. And those were kind of the last to really fall before we saw this extensive correction. So I look at the, the ARK Innovation ETF as one proxy. I also like the IWM, gives you a sense of small caps, the IWO kind of growth area of the small caps. And we can kind of see that these had a failed breakout. Um, and then kind of from there, there's a little bit of a change in character. And that's really kind of when I noticed a lot of the trades I was putting on got stopped out pretty quickly. Things weren't really following through. Uh, it got a little bit choppier. And just there were kind of less and less setups holding up and the overall kind of breadth of the market, um, you know, started started declining. And I was on a, a podcast, I think, last year uh, with Stan Weinstein, and he was looking at the same exact thing, uh, the accumulation distribution line, uh, you know, that that overall breadth of the market was declining, even as the market was making new highs. And that was telling for him that, you know, even though the indexes are at all time highs, what are the actual stocks, the growth stocks? Um, the stocks that we like to trade doing. And um, a lot of those were starting downtrends. A lot of the names like like Roku um, that had been leaders in 2020, 2021, those were failing those breakouts from late stage bases, becoming a little bit wider and loose, breaking under the 200 day moving average. And that's just a not, not a good sign unless we see kind of rotation into new areas. And we didn't quite see that outside of, you know, the oil and gas names, which have been doing tremendous over this year, but uh, not really what we love to trade. Uh, and just going back over to, um, yeah, XLE, super strong trend. But if you go back to the NASDAQ and positive Russia or the S&P 500, uh, what really kind of got me worried here uh, was, and if you could go to a daily, actually, I think that that's an easier way to see it. Uh, we had this kind of failed push up into all-time highs back in uh, late December. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we formed this nice handle and everybody was kind of expecting us to fall through through that pivot. But instead, what do we do? We kind of broke down from that consolidation area and undercut that. And from there, I was really on guard. And, and I think I was pushed to cash, stopped out at the rest of my names pretty much right in that area that day where we broke that consolidation. And, uh, you know, we weren't able to hold up above the 200 day. We know kind of nothing good happens under that 200 day moving average. And we've seen a few areas where if you're a short term trader, you can kind of profit from these short term rallies. Um, but Overall, it's been it's been a market where less is more. Uh, cash is definitely a position here, and and uh, the key thing is to protect your overall capital because even if you made great gains in 2020, 2021, um, you got to preserve it. And uh, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of people kind of round trip all that. So the key is to yeah. you know survive survive this type of market. So when we do get another sustained uptrend above all those moving averages, uh, that's when we can really start to compound our accounts. Yeah, and and what are your thoughts of just you know, kind of going through this bear market, just how severe or just how rapid these sell-offs are. Uh, any thoughts there just by seeing it kind of real time, day by day, just have you taken a step back at times and just said, wow, you know, this is really, really bad and just keeps getting worse? Yeah, I mean, I make uh, kind of market analysis videos every single weekend and I, I've been covering this, you know, every single weekend and just taking a step back and looking at this chart, it's amazing how, how far down we've come now. Um, and, you know, the volatility has been immense. I feel like every day this year, we've been up 1%, down 2%, up 3% the next day. It's a really tough environment to trade and, and manage risk effectively. And, um, you know, the, the corrections that I've experienced so far since 2018, uh, 2018, I just wrote down, I, I, did, I was just learning about stocks, uh, but the later co corrections, I was able to handle a little bit better. But, you know, the, the 2020 COVID crash, that was so severe and so fast that this, this kind of feels almost like a grind down where every single day yeah. we're just down further and further. And now we're potentially, you know, in a third leg down, however you want to see it. But um, this just feels like a grind where, where 
people are getting worn out, you know, um, versus the COVID crash where it was just kind of one sustained quick move down. So um, it's definitely been different. And I think I've learned a lot of patience this year and also in 2021 a little bit, um, you know, just trying to wait for that optimal pitch, um, you know, that that sweet spot where everything starts working, all those setups, as Arusha was talking about, start to appear and we can really, um, you know, start to enter those positions that are, you know, in uptrends when the overall market is just turning off of its lows. And, you know, I think that's the hardest part sometimes is that level of patience that you need. And as as traders, a lot of times we want to be doing something. It's it's right. boring to not be making money. And you're looking at your cash uh, just kind of sitting there doing nothing. And you're looking at your screens each day. And uh, there's always that temptation of like, oh, you know, it, could I try this? Could I try this? Or maybe this will work. And And how have you been kind of instilling in yourself that discipline to just say, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to keep on trying things. I'm not going to let this market grind me down. I'm just going to sit on my hands. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I have been guilty a little bit of, of, you know, trying to force things a little bit when it's not quite optimal this year. But I think I have done a good job of kind of keeping things small and, and managing risk really tight. So even if I do overtrade a little bit, given the environment, it doesn't hurt me too much. But I think the key thing for me is, you know, having access uh, to, to Ross Haber, um, right. who, who works with me over at Trail Line. He, he's seen a few. He's seen a he, few of those. He's <laughs> seen a few corrections. Absolutely. And and he's been kind of, a, you know, a whispering in my ear, you know, be patient, mm -hmm. be patient. Um, and obviously with his experience, I mean, it, it's great to have, you know, be able to text him and, and call him whenever I want. Um, and uh, yeah. I mean, really, really over the over the course of this entire year, just seeing every single day, he's just, you know, the conditions aren't right. The market leadership isn't st setting up. And sure enough, we, we've kind of seen the destruction as a result of that. Um, and patience, you know, it, it's such a important learned concept. And I think a lot of people are going to learn that um, over the course of this year. But are, are you sitting at your screen for the six and a half hours uh, still like like most people normally do in a bull market? Or are you? taking a little bit of time off, kind of trying to pull yourself a little bit away from the screens? Yeah, I, I've definitely taken more time off. Usually I'm in front of the screen for the first hour and then the last hour. Okay. Um, and then in between, I've got some alerts set on my phone. Uh, but I've definitely done a little bit more uh, this time around of, you know, going outside, playing soccer, rock climbing. Those are kind of my favorite things to do, um, nice. you know. And um, yeah, because I think if you're in front of your screen, you're going to go on those intraday charts. You're going to try to, mm -hmm. you know, force something. Uh, but taking a step back and and kind of looking at the end of the day, what what did stocks actually do? Um, and also looking at weekly charts, I think that really puts everything in perspective um, in terms of, you know, where are we at in the market cycle? And right now, things aren't setting up, you know, perfectly for for how we usually like to trade. Yeah. And, and, and just to add, well, and just quickly, Justin, just to add to that, like a lot of times when we go into these kind of corrections, I, I will kind of almost force myself to stay away from the screens. And, and because this is the only time, this is the only opportunity where you kind of get that chance to have a mental break, right? right. It's when, when you're in kind of like obviously 2020, but even 2021, when there are a lot, there were opportunities and stuff like that, you're glued and, and it, it can be, it can mentally just wear you down. And so you need to take almost advantage of, of these times to, to rest up and prepare for that kind of next uh, bull market. Yeah. And oh. I, I think just to add to that, uh, sorry, Justin, for cutting you off, but uh, Ross, one more thing that uh, he really emphasizes is during corrections, bear markets, you want to preserve both your mental and financial yeah. capital. Yes. So you want to protect, you know, your, your, your account balance, but also protect your confidence. So when we finally do get that turn, you haven't been worn down over and over trying and forcing things. Instead, you're fresh, you're ready to take advantage of, you know, the, the tremendous opportunities that are going to come out of the end of this bear market correction. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key is knowing that those opportunities and, as you said, those good pitches um, are coming and, you know, being right. I guess the, the, the whole idea is having that that hope, that um, confidence, you know, that that things are going to get better. And I think that sometimes allows a lot of people to kind of stay stay away a little bit and, you know, pass on some of the bad pitches, some of the when the cards aren't looking right, you know, to just fold quickly before you get hurt. But um, was anyone else kind of getting an image of Richard uh, maybe hanging from a rock climbing, getting an alert and maybe putting a trade on? Or was that just uh, <laughs> not, I do now. Yeah. <laughs> I do now. OK, well, we, we try to paint a picture for those that are listening uh, as well. So when we come back, we're going to get a little bit more into this whole theory versus reality. And hey, during a bear market, if it's a time to be educating yourself, then where are some resources that you can turn to? So stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Peter Skoufis, founder of Skoufis Capital, has successfully managed money using Bill O'Neill's strategy for the last 17 years. Peter's missed major market crashes, such as the financial crisis of 2008, and most recently, the coronavirus crash of 2020. One of his strengths is finding new leadership in new market uptrends. If you would like to talk to Peter and get his thoughts on the current market and what to do now, or get a complimentary review of your portfolio, feel free to contact him at scoofuscapital.com. That's S-K-O-U-F-I-S capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L dot com. And fill out the contact form or by calling 866-562-2634. Protect your capital and don't miss the next market uptrend. Okay, welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with Arusha Pierce from O'Neill Global Advisors and Richard Moglin from Trader Lion. So, Richard, you've had, I mean, you you, you kind of did some name dropping earlier with uh, having Stan Weinstein on your show. You've had some really great traders on your show. Uh, could you maybe talk about some of the some of the ones that impressed you the most and some of the lessons that you feel like really got solidified uh, by either the, the the chats that you've had, the interviews that you've had, uh, any aha moments that you could share with our listeners? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I'm not sure if there's kind of one singular aha moment, but um, I feel like the the interviews I, I I've done and the you know the chance to talk with you know David Ryan, Mark Minervini, uh, Jim Ropel, all the all these great traders. I think it's been you know essential to kind of accelerate my learning curve a little bit, and I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Um, in turn, like I said, there's no kind of singular aha moment, um, but I would say there are definitely a few things that stand out. And what's kind of interesting with all these different interviews is many of them have widely different styles and kind of timeframes, right? Mark Minervini is more of a swing trader momentum, uh, David Ryan, Jim Rope a little bit on the slower side, you know, position trading, accumulating positions over time, trying to hold for that, that 18 months that market leaders, you know, tend to trend. Um, but what, what kind of links all of them are some kind of key principles that have really stood out to me. So a few of those are whatever their style, uh, they went back and studied history and analyzed the, the greatest performing stocks and tried to find edges and, and characteristics that all of those shared. And they incorporated kind of that research into their own process. So, you know, studying breakouts, um, studying pullbacks, uh, looking and basically trying to find these edges and, you know, I think that research is so, so important. And taking it a step further, I think a really key um, characteristic and principle that all those all of them shared was, you know, a huge emphasis on risk management, um, protecting yeah. the downside and focusing on that even more than, you know, um, on the upside. Because at the end of the day, it's kind of a math equation. Uh, you have to average more on your winners than your losers. And the more you can kind of push that ratio in your favor and, and try to get those outsized returns um, and basically a bunch of small returns, uh, sm small losers rather, uh, that's really going to basically lead to incredible performance. So whatever the time frame and whatever the style, Mark Minervini, Jim Ropel, Ryan Pierpont, all these guys really focus on um, leveraging that risk reward relationship and uh, basically skewing it in their favor. And I think the last really key thing that I wanted to mention was all these guys, uh, you know, they didn't start out great. Uh, they started just like any other trader um, and, you know, they paid their dues. Some of, the, some of them weren't profitable for years. But I think a, a key thing that they all share is they went back and studied their previous trades. They studied their winners. They studied their losers and, you know, tried to identify those areas where, you know, they were lacking or, or making a mistake over and over again. Um, all these guys have had tremendous sex, uh, setbacks. Um, another interview, um, another amazing trader I've got a chance to interview, uh, obviously he works for William O'Neill company, Charles Harris. Uh, he talked about in his trader's journey video, which I think is, I would highly recommend for anybody to watch so many setbacks and huge drawdowns, but he never gave back, gave up. He, he kind of studied his own stuff and tried to identify those key things that were holding it back. And I found that to be incredibly helpful. Um, and just myself, you know, my first year, I found that a common mistake that I was making over and over again was entering a strong stock when it had already kind of run from that proper pivot point when I was, yeah. I was basically trying to enter it when it was already extended. And then I would just kind of get stopped out, um, you know, on a natural reaction, normal price action, and then it would just take off without me. I'm sure everybody watching or listening can, can kind of empathize with that. Um, so I think doing post analysis, studying yourself, studying your patterns, uh, you're going to find so many gems out there. Um, and uh, all you got to do from that point on is just try to improve a little bit with every single trade, 
every single year. And, you know, over, you know, 10 years, a decade, decade plus, uh, you're going to be such a better trader than you were uh, when you first got started. So I think those are three main things that have really stood out to me from my interviews. Do, do you generally consider yourself better at kind of the breakout trading or, or the, the pullback trading? Have, have oh, I'm, noticed? yeah, I'm definitely more on the breakout side of things. Um, what I will do is, um, if it's a pullback to a level of interest, like the 50 day moving average or a prior pivot level, I'll usually take it down to a 65 minute time frame and then look for a kind of volatility contraction pattern on that lower time frame. And that's kind of how I, I treat the, uh, uh, you know, the pullback buying, but I'm never somebody who is just going to blindly uh, buy when it's pulling back to, to a level just because it should work. It should rebound from there. I'm always kind of looking for that you know, that confirmation in terms of a, a push upward on that lower time frame before I enter. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want to add, uh, I, the, the post analysis, I absolutely agree with you, Richard. I mean, that's such an important part of any trader's kind of path of learning, that learning curve. You've got to kind of look at your own stuff. Um, but I'd also just add that you have to learn from it. You know, there's so yep. many people that will kind of do the do the analysis, but then they don't change their behavior. You've got to you've got to put in rules or something like that uh, to, to change that behavior and eventually turn things around. Because if you just keep on doing the same same stuff and expecting a different result, you know, then it, it's just not going to it's not going to work for you. So were there any any things about your post analysis? And again, I know this is kind of the first big correction, but, you know, you you had 2020, which was very quick. Um, you started in 2018 and there was there was a bear market there was was there any have you had a, a chance to do any post analysis on your own stuff that kind of came through uh i mean it sounds like the extended part was one yeah. thing that you came up with but any other uh insights that you came up with uh enter your own personality yeah absolutely and i think another big thing that came into uh came into play in 2019 2020 was I was kind of trick taking trades that were a little bit random. They didn't quite fit a particular setup. Um, I was still kind of refining my process at that point. I'm still doing so, of course. Um, and I was focusing on kind of subpar setups, if that makes sense. Um, mm. A big thing that I've taken away from, from Jim Ropel is focus on the leaders, focus on the leaders, focus on the leaders. Uh, those are going to be the ones where you make the big money over time. And I was trading these kind of smaller cap names, less liquid um, and, you know, not with optimal buy points. And I've definitely refined my buying process a, a lot better uh, nowadays. Um, and one more thing I want to talk about with post analysis is um, it, it definitely, you know, it doesn't feel great to go back and look at your losers. <laughs> uh, I, I don't I think everybody can agree with that, but I kind of view it. Um, I, I've been an athlete in my past life, uh, baseball, soccer, and it, it's kind of like um, tweaking a swing in, in baseball. Um, if, you, if you're going through a slump and you're not you're not uh, you're not hitting well. Uh, you want to go ahead and, and film your swing and see if anything you really stands out. And often there is a very obvious thing that you're you're not doing well. And just by analyzing that and looking back at your mistakes and, and when you've not performed well, you can find one thing that can really change your performance. So, um, yeah, post analysis, I try to do it um, at least twice a year. I should, probably should do it more. Uh, but I think uh, it's a thing that most traders don't do, honestly. And I think it can only help you improve as a trader. So I'd highly recommend it. What about some guests that are outside of kind of our realm, right? Out of, outside right. of kind of the traditional kind of growth stock investing that we talk about here. Uh, any kind of lessons that you learned uh, from maybe a value investor or uh, some other type of investor? Yeah, I, I've had a few investors on the show. Most of my most of my guests do tr tend to be kind of definitely a trader and, and most likely a growth style trader. Uh, but I do want to pivot a little bit and not answer your question perfectly, Arusha, and uh, instead focus on a uh, one one trader who I've learned a lot from, and that's Brian Shannon. And he doesn't come from a kind of classic cancel background, but a lot of his stuff, it, you know, it's, it's the same principles uh, as I said, risk management, um, yeah. all of that. And what I really took away from him and and his book, which is excellent, um, is looking at multiple time frames, looking at mm -hmm. a daily chart, a weekly chart, a monthly chart, uh, an hourly chart, and you know, making sure all of those are aligned when you're trying to enter a position. Um, and I think doing that type of multi time frame analysis is so key and allows you to identify if the trend is with you. And if you're trying to force something in a suboptimal setup or if everything's kind of aligned and uh, the path, the path of le least resistance is up. So I think that's a key thing um, in terms of investors. I'm trying to think I I've had a few on. Um, I think what what's key for them is that their time frame is so much longer right. and their sell signals it's interesting it's it's 
usually nothing to do with price action. Um, it's more about kind of red flags that show up, um, you know, from an earnings report or the CEO leaves, that type of thing. Uh, but I think the best, you know, either traders or investors, uh, the best ones have a discipline for buying and a discipline for selling. They've got buy rules and sell, sell rules. You have to have both parts of your equation. I think there's a William O'Neill quote that says, uh, um, I, I'm going to butcher it completely, but uh, I, basically trading without um, sell rules is like uh, driving a car without any brakes. I probably butchered yeah. that terribly, um, but I think it's so, so key. And I think a lot of people are kind of realizing that when you know the stocks that performed so well in 2020, they're not just still going up. They're, we're seeing some pullback. And um, I think it's important to, to know when you want to sell and know when you want to take profits, especially as a trader. Yeah. I mean, there are so many people that got into that trap of buy on the dip, buy on the dip, which works great until it doesn't. And then when it doesn't, it's unfortunately uh, can be lead to massive failures. And so that's why I thought it was so interesting that, again, one of those key points you came away with is that whole risk management side, kind of that asymmetric trade where the benefits you know far outweigh the risks and it's it's one of those things where if you can just get the math working toward for you you can have so many mistakes that are forgiven when you've got that um those big winners that can make up for a lot of the small losers um so in addition to post analysis i mean that's certainly one of the things that um you know, people can be doing on their downtime besides rock climbing and playing soccer. Uh, uh, you can also be doing a lot of this education stuff. You, you've talked a lot about um, some of the interviews you've had, and I, I just want to, you know, do a quick plug. Why don't you tell people where they can find these interviews if they haven't seen you already? Because I, I think you've just done a, a great job with uh, how, how deep you get into with a lot of these investors. So where, where, can, where can people find that? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, you can find uh, my, my podcast. It's a YouTube podcast. Uh, it's called the Market Chat Podcast. And if you just go ahead and search on YouTube, uh, Richard Moglen, M-O-G-L-E-N, um, or just search the Market Chat Podcast, you should be able to find it. Um, and I've had great guests like uh, Arusa and Justin Nielsen on uh, recently, <laughs> um, as well as you know um, a lot of veteran traders, a lot of people who I've learned an incredible amount from. And also, I, I've been privileged to talk with you know Mark Minervini, um, and as well as my own podcast, I also do the Trader Line podcast. I'm the host of that right. as well. And I've gone to speak with Stan Weinstein, uh, Mark Minervini as, as well, David Ryan. That, that was a special one for me. I, I've learned so much from him. And, um, and Mark Ritchie, the, the second as well. Yep. That was a great get. Um, so yeah, if you can either search the Mark Jet podcast or the Trader Line podcast on YouTube, uh, you should be able to find us. Mm -hmm. And one other thing kind of on the education side, um, you, you started talking a little bit about how some of these traders were looking at things other than maybe the technical um, side, uh, you know, things in the earnings report. Um, can, can you kind of share a little bit about some of those things and, and where you get that information of, hey, there's something changing here, either on the macro side, the fundamental side, or what have you? What, what kind of things are you looking at? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was actually, I just did an interview with Jason Thompson, of course, of O'Neill, uh, mm -hmm. ju just, just, it was either yesterday or the day before. And his focus, even though he, he's obviously got that can slim mandate background, his focus is, is very much fundamental, which actually kind of surprised me. Yeah. And he's focusing so much on, you know, what's going on in the sector, what's going on in the industry, what does this company have that's different and exciting, uh, that makes it stand out from the competition. And, um, yeah, looking for, I think the key, the key fundamental thing that I look for is that N and Canceling, that new factor. And I think that's that's something that um, can really change your perspective in terms of looking at companies and looking at setups because you know we've seen setups this year in like Caterpillar and and mm -hmm. those type of slower, more mature names. But what is new that's going on in those stocks? Like there's not necessarily anything new, even if it's setting up, you know, near the top of a base it's not going to double and triple because of a new innovation. So I'm always kind of keeping an ear out and, and looking around me in terms of, you know, what, what is new around here? What's going to be, you know, this explosive industry. And I went back and, and did a video looking at Apple back coming out of the 2000, 2003 bear market. And right at the bottom, I thought it was really interesting. They came out with the iTunes store as well mm -hmm. as a new generation of iPods. And that was, that was basically what caused, you can see it in the chart, there's there's a huge burst on volume right off the lows that was basically caused by those announcements and caused by um, them selling a million songs in the first week on the iTunes store and those type of innovations you know a, a new product a new service a new CEO they can completely turn a company around we've seen that in AMD as well Lisa Sue's done a tremendous job 
Um, and there's so many, you know, countless examples going back to, you know, all the greatest winning stocks. So I think that end factor for me in terms of fundamentals, that's what's most important. And um, even the fundamental um, investors who I've interviewed, they're always looking for that something uh, that makes a company special. And uh, that's what I'm, what I'm always basically looking for on the fundamental side. Now, uh, in, in, so in, in 2021, where you had GameStop and all these SPACs going crazy. Um, the meme stocks. Uh, the meme stocks, thank you. Right. Uh, now, did you have friends who were, who were participating in that? And were you trying to you know, help them out? or Because uh, yeah, obviously, you, you're, you're still very young and you've, you've learned a ton already. But you, ha you have a lot of friends, too, right, who are probably dabbling a little bit, but not really. Have, have they have they come to you for a, a little bit of advice or are they interested in the market? So I'm just curious how that how that's going. Yeah, it's funny you say that. And I don't know if they come to me and for advice, I more like thrust advice on them. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely I definitely had some some friends who got involved and, and made a decent amount of money as well, which is great. Uh, but it was funny on the, the day or the day before it finally topped GameStop, I had about six different individual friends and family members, you know, text me and say, Hey, do you know what's going on with GameStop? And I was like, you know, we're, we're close to the end of it. Right. So it's interesting how that works. Um, but yeah, it was a crazy, crazy phenomenon. Phenom yeah. Yeah. Phenomenon to watch. And, and, uh, it's funny how that kind of coincidence lines up, but, um, yeah, I, I try to emphasize risk management. You know, you made, you made a thousand dollars, sell half at least lock that in. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, some people took the advice, some people didn't. So, uh, <laughs> and the reason why I bring that up too, Richard, not, not only just to hear hear kind of your 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 thoughts on that or, or from your friends, but I, when I was your age and I was starting to get into this, I couldn't really. I'll try to get other people to get into it. Hey, this this seems pretty cool. You want to learn this with me? And no one was interested in it. Um, and and so have have you had any other friends get involved in this uh, and just start studying this, or are you just kind of you, you, you're kind of uh, doing this on your own? And obviously these days, yeah, I mean you've you've tapped into a much larger community where where you can learn from. Yeah, it's it's nice to have Twitter where we can all kind of all all as chart nerds can can yeah, can exactly. pool and exchange find, ideas. Find your friends and yeah, your exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so so how I got started in this and, and get got interest in stocks of people who don't know, I took a class at the University of Maryland and um, I loved it, taught by Dr. Eric Wish. It's fantastic. He, yep. He's a cancel investor, 50 years. Um, and after I took that class, I was like, wow, this is the most amazing class I've ever taken. And I tried to convince, you know, all my friends at UMP to, to sign up the next year. And I actually got three of my roommates to take it as well. And and uh, some of them have enjoyed it more than others. But, uh, you know, they, they all found that it was incredibly valuable. Um, other than that, I've had a few kind of cousins. My sister got into it a little bit. Um, but you know, I think there's a special type of person who really loves this and falls in love and, and becomes passionate enough to, you know, survive those first, you know, drawdowns and all of that. So, right. um, it kind of, you, you kind of, it has to find you. I think the market has to find you and, and trigger something inside you. So, uh, if I you don't agree. have that passion, um, uh, you're not going to stick around. So. Yeah. And I think there's something also, too, that you you talked a little bit about uh, that is in common with some of these great traders is there's almost a little bit of a love of history, you know, that yeah. that willingness to go back and look at the past and see what you can get from it. And, you know, recognize that things aren't always going to play out exactly the same way, but that there's enough things that are similar that it gives you an edge. And uh, you know, not a lot of people are willing, you know, a lot of people look at the past and say, well, there's just nothing to learn from this is, you know, things were different 100 years ago, and there's nothing to learn there. But then there's others that are like, hey, no, there's there is something, you know, that there there are these cycles, there are these similarities. And um, yeah, it's I, I, I think you're right. I think there, are, it does attract a certain type of person, a certain type of nerd, maybe. Uh, <laughs> as you yeah. said. <laughs> that that's great. I don't know. I don't know if you you guys have had John Boyk on, on the podcast yet, but he we're gonna have him on at the Trailline podcast uh, Trailline conference this year, which we're really looking forward to about. And in his books, uh, you know, Monster Stocks, as well as yeah. uh, the other books, how how legendary traders made millions. He went back and went to you know the eighteen hundreds even and looked at mm -hmm. how uh, Darvis, Livermore, all these great traders were trading the markets. And it's eerie how similar everything is. Yeah. I mean, you can replace right. the names of, of any of these right. stocks and, you know, the leaders topped before the market. Then the the great trader noticed stocks bucking the overall trend and that started the uptrend and they made uh, a great amount of money coming out of that correction. So 
the same thing happens over and over again, and he calls it market analysis. So I think it's really important and, and really interesting if you're into this to go back and and study history, and you can learn a lot from it. Um, I've been my, the first book I ever read was Nicholas Darvis's How I Made Two Million Dollars in the Market. A really quick read, and I think it's a great intro because it's it's kind of fun. It's a story, um, but you know. Just that simple book, him telling his story about how he made all these mistakes and, and learned mm -hmm. from it. Um, it's such a great education because, you know, maybe that first time you don't understand quite all the lessons. But after you've kind of gone through, you know, a market cycle and gotten more experience, reading it back, you notice, oh, I've made that same exact mistake. This is what I can do to fix it. This is what I should be looking for. And it's such a great education. And I think reminiscences of a stock market operator is that same thing uh, with every reread you get you know, one more golden nugget that you can take from and, and improve your trading just a little bit with. It almost becomes a different book, you know, with, yes, right. with some of these, at least I found. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Well, that, that's great stuff. Uh, so when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the stocks that are on Richard's radar as he's learned from all of these greats and is getting great himself. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Peter Skoufis, founder of Skoufis Capital, has successfully managed money using Bill O'Neill's strategy for the last 17 years. Peter's missed major market crashes, such as the financial crisis of 2008, and most recently, the coronavirus crash of 2020. One of his strengths is finding new leadership in new market uptrends. If you would like to talk to Peter and get his thoughts on the current market and what to do now, or get a complimentary review of your portfolio, feel free to contact him at scoofuscapital.com. That's S-K-O-U-F-I-S capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L.com. And fill out the contact form or by calling 866-562-2634. Protect your capital and don't miss the next market uptrend. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It's Justin Nielsen here along with Arusha Paris from O'Neill Global Advisors and Richard Moglin from Trader Lion. So... Richard, uh, I know that you've been talking about having patience, sitting on your hands a lot. Um, you know, we have a potential rally attempt going on. So could you tell us a little bit about maybe some of the setups that you're seeing out there, some of the things that are kind of capturing your attention? Yeah, sure thing. And uh, like you said, we're maybe seeing a little bit of a move off the lows here. I think it's just a few days old now. Uh, we haven't gotten that fall through day, uh, but we are seeing some groups kind of try to buck the overall trend and maybe Arusha, you could bring up just uh, TAN, uh, the overall solar kind of ETF there, because uh, I think this is a good point for people and kind of exemplifies what I'm looking for. Um, so when the overall market just made a lower low, this overall group, which is the solar ETF, made a higher low. So I'm trying to kind of pick out these names and, and ETFs and industry groups that are showing relative strength versus the market. And you can see that, of course, from that higher low that I pointed out, as well as that relative strength line exactly. Uh, that's in a nice uptrend as the market is pulling back. Uh, so I'm always trying to look and identify those overall groups to go fishing in. And once you know you identify a group that's kind of standing out a little bit, bucking that downtrend, you can go in and uh, try to find individual stocks. So um, a name that's not in the solar group but is in a similar kind of industry group that's acting well um, is UTHR, uh, United Therapeutics. And this is in the biotech space and a lot of the healthcare biotech names uh, once again, have been forming those higher lows as the market has been pulling back in. You can see that this is well above its moving averages, acting great. And better than that, it's trading right near all-time highs. If you go over to a monthly chart quickly, you can see that this has very little resistance above. It's right near all-time highs. So, you know, there's nobody waiting higher to sell at break even, which always, for me, is kind of when uh, I have the best results with a potential trade. So UTHR, I actually put this on just today. Um, as it recovered strongly off the lows. Um, if you go over to a daily chart, uh, we had a nice push off the 21 EMA. It was also pulling back into a prior pivot level. So there are kind of two different areas of interest that kind of had some nice confluence there, that 21 exponential moving average lining up with that pivot. And then we had a nice push yesterday on good volume. Uh, I missed it that day. But today we had a gap down, strong recovery right in the morning. And as it pulled back through that kind of 222 cheap pivot, um, that's when I kind of uh, executed the trade. I think I got in around 224 um, and it closed really strongly. So uh, this is a small position right now, only 5%. I'm still kind of treading pretty lightly because of the overall market conditions, uh, but we'll see how this trade works out. And if it, if it does, and we start to see more and more groups kind of participating um, and acting strong, then I'll try to increase my exposure and uh, get into more opportunities that are breaking out. So UTHR, um, nice action. Look at that relative strength line. Uh, basically going uh, super strong 
in, in a super strong uptrend. And, you know, keep it simple. As I said before, uh, there's above all its moving averages when the overall market is below it. That's a, basically a big clue in terms of relative strength. So um, next up, I think we want to talk about, or is yeah, there any questions you, about this uh, one? Yeah. You, well, before you mention, well, first, I totally agree, uh, Richard, with all, with all you said. I mean, it's strong break. I hang uh, One of the few stocks that's hanging in there pretty well. And also, I should mention that uh, the firm, our, our firm uh, owns this stock. So I'll just say that. And we put it on a swing trader yesterday. So I, I, I agree with you. I like that the in both days, both these days, um, you, you had kind of a volume spike. I mean, we kind of discount Friday's volume, the options expiration and everything right. will, will distort a little bit. But the fact that you had that volume remain heavy as it kind of got got that support and also closed in the uh, higher ranges. Now, one thing about the biotech space, um, you know, sometimes it feels like you you almost need a PhD in, in biology to understand all of the things that are going on, um, you know, whether it's the... Uh, you know, the, the, the phase, you know, what phase trials are going on, what what those do. And then there's also the uncertainty of, hey, will it even work? You know, will the trial come out and lead to something in fruition uh, of, of a life changing drug or treatment? Um, how do you how do you handle the fundamental side of the bio biomed and biotech industry? Yeah, like you said, uh, there's a lot of complexity here and kind of added risk. I mean, I think we saw I forget what biotech stock it was, but we just saw a gap down like 20% the next day on, on a trial miss or something. Uh, there's oh, definitely it, uh, that adder. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, so with these biotechs, I'm kind of staying focused on the ones that have earnings and sales growth and, and decent fund ownership um, and try to, trying to basically, you know, fish in that type of pond uh, because I don't want that added risk of, you know, it could gap down, you know, 20, 30 plus percent the next day. Um, so I'm, I'm still playing it safe and, and I'm going to keep my overall exposure to this group uh, decently low. And, and hopefully we see other groups kind of confirm and start to move up as well. Uh, but that's kind of how I handle it. I don't have a PhD in, in, in <laughs> uh, you know, bioengineering, all that. Arusha, I know you almost went that route. Uh, but uh, yeah. Well, you do have my, a master's in engineering though, right? Or, or you're I don't. I, uh, I haven't completed it yet, a uh, master's okay. in engineering, but uh, it, it doesn't transfer over to the biotech space. So, you know, I'm listening to the chart. <laughs> I'm listening to the earnings and sales, and that, that's kind of how I'm going about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, you mentioned TAN, uh, the solar stocks, uh, you know, kind of doing something interesting. Um, I'm, I'm going to correct Arusha's markup real quick, because when you when you looked at that new low that the S&P 500 hit, uh, you were looking at kind of a, a lower part in the in TAN that happened, but it was really kind of this, this last two weeks. I mean, it's actually a higher low, way right. higher. Um, and so end phase is one that shows that. Now, uh, Walk us through this. I mean, this is a, a very heavily, uh, he heavy volatility, let's just say. I mean, this can move 7%, 8% in a day, and that's normal. So uh, talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing here and how you're handling the extra risk. Yeah, absolutely. So just taking a step back, um, and if, actually, if you go back to a weekly chart, um, this was a group that I, I played nicely in 2020. There were some nice moves. SEDG, Solar Edge was yeah. another name I was watching. Uh, but then we had, you know, a break of the 10 week and we started longer term basing pattern. And it looked like in 2021, we were starting to break out again. I think I, I played it and, and got stopped out there. Uh, but we just pretty much been going sideways for, you know, a, a bunch of months. I don't know how that, how many that is eight, eight, 10 months now. Um, so we're, we're in a basing pattern. Uh, but I kind of picked up on that relative strength that, that you were talking about with the higher lows and, it is a more volatile name and, and that's kind of when, you know, really precise entries where you can easily manage your risk. And it's also a logical stop loss as well. That's really key. And I'm kind of viewing this right now as a swing trade, especially kind of in this hit and run environment until the market really confirms a new uptrend. So going back to that daily chart, uh, what I looked for here um, was kind of an oops reversal. So uh, yesterday we had a nice push up off the moving averages, a decent volume as well. Then today, the overall market kind of gapped down and this basically pulled back in um, and uh, kind of pulled back in right to its pivot and it opened right under the prior day's low. Uh, so what I like to do with this, especially for swing trades, is enter as it pushes back through that low and that's called an oops reversal. Um, it, it, it was coined, I believe, by Larry Williams. And uh, it's often a great way to enter a stock in an uptrend where maybe you, you missed a prior entry, a pullback entry, and uh, I always, you know, basically use it in a strong stock and an uptrend and we're above the moving averages. 
And basically, I'm managing my risk right at today's low of the, low of the day. So if it undercuts that, I'm gone. Um, and uh, like I said, with UTHR, I'm still playing with just 5% positions um, to manage that risk. And, and I'll use progressive exposure to um, you know increase position size if we do see confirmation from these trades as well as other groups. And now one of the things with the solar stocks, I guess that is a concern, is it, it, it feels like there was certainly a push before. Uh, it seemed like there were some, you know, some politics involved, you know, whether it was the, the infrastructure plan and, hey, what, what's going to happen with solar stocks? Uh, there's kind of the, the talk now with uh, some of the tariffs with the Chinese uh, names uh, being being relaxed a little bit. Uh, does it does it concern you about that that political risk that okay if, if a deal doesn't happen uh, or there's all this expectation and then the expectations can be dashed? Um, so how do you how do you handle that kind of political risk that can happen? Yeah, for, for me it's it's kind of all reflected in the charts, and I've got a really tight and logical stop here where you've got that low of the day as well today. As I mentioned, uh, it also lines up with the twenty one exponential moving average. So. If it undercuts that low, basically that setup for me is invalidated and I'll yeah. get out with a small loss. Um, ideally, you know, it push up here, rest a little bit before it challenges those prior pivots around, you know, 217, 220 area, form another handle. And maybe I can even add to the position there as it confirms to there. Uh, right now, it's, it's still it's the first day of the trade. So if it stops me out tomorrow, no harm done. Um, ideally, we get a push for a few days and I get a little bit more of a cushion. Um, but you know, for me, this is still a swing trade. I'm not looking for a home run and, um, I'm, I'm managing me, managing my risk both through my stop loss as well as my overall position size. So that political risk for me, um, it, that's kind of more fundamental than I usually go. And for me, it's all about, you know, the overall price action. How does all that information get filtered through the hedge funds, the institutions, all the other different traders, and how does it ultimately show up in, in the price and volume action? And I think your entry, you know, the fact that you're being very precise with your entry, as you say, um, allows you to manage that risk a little bit better. And so, yeah, if, if something doesn't go your way, you don't get that hurt as opposed to that problem of buying extended. And then a, a normal pullback can happen and, and you're, you're, you're just not you're not in good position to, to, to either sit through it or you take a bigger loss than you should. So. Yeah, exactly. I think a precise entry is, is sometimes the best defense in the market because, you know, then your stop loss, you're, you're not going to hurt yourself on a normal stop loss hit. And you've got that confidence to try a stock multiple times. And and if it just one time it works, it might pay for all those different losses. So I think keeping a tight and logical stop loss and entering a specific area where you can know quickly if you're right or wrong, is such a big key thing in my trading. And it's definitely something I've improved upon over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I would add also that uh, in a normal market, you know, uh, this probably wouldn't necessarily come too high on my radar. Uh, but in a kind of market that we're in right now, where it's very, very slim pickings, this with the relative strength, it, it kind of yeah. like sticks out. It's like, wow, it's actually hanging in there. And, and then finally, this this is another stock that we do own in the firm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And oh, sorry, to, sorry to cut you off one more time, Justin. No, I just, no, I don't please yeah. do. Please do. I just, yeah, I just want to say that <laughs> For me, in, in a correction like this, I'm kind of trying to keep a wide net and just kind of try to collect evidence in terms of potential stocks that could be, you know, big leaders that are coming out of larger basing patterns that are nearish to all-time highs, above most, you know, resistance points. Um, and I'm looking here and we're seeing the relative strength line increasing nicely. I'm seeing higher lows when the, the overall market is making lower lows. I'm seeing it above the 21 EMA, which is rising. So those kind of, you know, pieces of evidence kind of point me towards the stock. And, and I'm, I'm looking now for, you know, after I've, I've identified the, those pieces of evidence, those edges, uh, then I'm looking for a potential entry setup. And uh, we did get one here where I can manage my risk effectively. So that's why I'm always kind of looking for during a correction bear market is evidence. What can be the next leaders? And this, you know, it's not the prettiest chart, like you said, but it's one of the better looking ones out there um, for sure. And kind of the growth space. Yeah, on a relative basis, it's it's yes. about as pretty as you get, right? right. <laughs> it's right. not it's not down seventy percent uh, like so many right. things are. So um, now let's talk a little bit about IPOs. Um, I, I mean, twenty twenty one had so many SPACs, IPOs, uh, things things just got crazy. It was the highest number since two thousand, and it was it was just remarkable how many there were. I think it was well over well over eight hundred. Um, so let's take a look at uh, CRDO. Uh, this is an IPO this year, uh, really coming out in a rough market. What is it about this stock that's kind of catching your attention? Yeah, so 
once again, it's kind of those those elements of relative strength that I'm looking for. And, you know, the overall RS rating is 92, which, you know, considering the chart, you might not expect. But, you know, relative to the rest of the market, this has been holding up pretty well. Um, this is, you know, it, it, it corrected pretty far from all time highs. But then we saw a big upside reversal week on uh, decent volume. And from there, we've we've managed to push above, you know, the daily moving averages and start once again, a kind of higher low setup on that daily chart. Um, so what I, what I like about the stock as well is we did have that gap up on earnings. I always like to, to keep an eye on those stocks that have, uh, you know, strong price reactions to earnings. I believe it had an earnings surprise as well. And just looking at the earnings and the fundamentals, we have triple digit growth in terms of earnings. Uh, sales growth is 90%, which isn't too darn bad. Um, and also the estimates for 2024, that is something I really look at. And, and you know, estimates 233%, that's pretty enormous. So, you know, those are kind of the elements that I'm looking at this chart. And, and it looks, it looks um, you know, it looks like it's shaping up as well as the fundamentals. And there are definitely some drawbacks here. First of all, it's not all-time highs. Uh, second of all, the overall group isn't performing too well. It's only ranked 188 out of 197. And usually I like to, you know, fish in that that top 40 um, mark. So the top 40 industry groups per market smith. Uh, but given the, you know, the strength of the chart over the past few weeks and, and where the overall market is in, this is definitely one that, you know, I'm looking at. And uh, today we had a nice um, inside bar although we did close pretty poorly. Look at the volume today versus, you know, the the volume on updates recently. Uh, so that definitely catches my interest. Uh, but once again, in this type of market, this could completely undercut today's lows and the, the day before that low uh, and and uh, continue to correct. So you got to be patient with this and, and only trade it if you're managing risk tightly and uh, you've got an edge. And, uh, you know, you could potentially play it inside bar and up tomorrow if it progresses through that point. Um, but you know, this might still need, you know, a few months, um, few weeks to, to shape up here and, and maybe it just kind of continues to base out until the market is ready to make a, make a decision in terms of its direction. And then it starts to progress. But I think this is a IPO worth watching. Um, I always like seeing that triple digit earnings growth and the overall chart to me, uh, suggests that, uh, yeah, this is something to have on your watch list at least. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that the group isn't that great, so yep. you know it, it's a one. What was it? One hundred eighty-eight out right. of one hundred ninety-seven. So not a great group. So is there something that when you're when you're looking at a stock in a not great group, what kind of gives you the confidence that hey these guys are doing something different? Or uh, I mean, do you again do you kind of dig down to the fundamentals in that in that regard, or is it just again a relative strength play that uh, this sticks out compared to everything else in the market? Yeah, I think it's the latter. It's it's more the relative strength. And the fact that it is a recent IPO suggests that it could be doing something different. Um, I haven't do dove too deep into the, the fundamentals in this one. I probably will do uh, this weekend. Um, but, you know, the fact that standing out a recent IPO, it's it's got that end factor in terms of its where it's at in its price cycle. We've already undercut that that day one low, the week low there. So taking care of that statistic from the life cycle trade. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the group and, and sector make up 50% or you can correlate the the performance of a stock to 50% is the sector and industry group. So that is a big thing to keep an eye on. But, you know, in this market where I'm trying to cast a wide net, this is just one to have on the watch list. And it's an IPO that I think is worth, you know, keeping an eye on. And any liquidity issues? This is kind of one that it's a little bit lower priced. Um, and the average volume is under half a million. Um, do you have like a liquidity requirement for yourself? I don't have a specific one. I prefer at least over 20 million and ideally over 50, 100 million. So that's definitely another kind in of dollar volume. Knock. Yeah, in dollar volume, exactly. Right. So that's another knock against the stock. Uh, you know, maybe we get another push upward and we start to see volume really come in and we maybe start, start to see some spikes on the weekly, but it could definitely improve a lot in terms of the dollar volume. I 100% agree. Mm -hmm. But it's also an IPO, so sometimes it takes a little time for those uh, institutional investors to get involved. I don't know. I, I, I'm not familiar with the owners and funds. I don't know if there's any owners and funds no, on this some, one. Not right yeah, now. Yeah, so not right now. But um, yeah, sometimes that takes some time. Uh, so we'll see. But definitely one to keep an eye on. I, hey, Richard, I really want to thank you for coming on. I mean, you're usually on the other side of things where you're the one asking the questions. So I appreciate you uh, giving all the answers to what you've learned uh, in your time and uh, you know, what, what you've gleaned from all these in, interviews that you've done and, you know, shared your experience uh, too, because it sounds like you are on the right track. 
Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me on. Always great talking with uh, you and Arusha, and and uh, it's a lot of fun to come on. So thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, and we'll, I'm sure, have you again soon. And uh, I'll, I'll be talking to you soon because we've got a meeting uh, shortly after on a different yep. topic. But, um, hey, I want to just make sure that people can follow you on Twitter also. Can you go ahead and give them your Twitter handle? Yeah, sure. So on Twitter, you can find me at Richard Moglen. And once again, Moglen is spelled M-O-G-L-E-N. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for having me once again, guys. And hopefully uh, there's some good takeaways for people and uh, they, they got something out of this. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure they did. On the, on the show next week, it's going to just be Arusha and I. So we're going to have a little bit of we time. Uh, we hope you join us for that. And thank you so much for watching us today. We'll see you next time. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. 